Um, yeah. Who am I? Uh, my name is Frederick Stromberg. Uh, I uh, run a VPN service called uh, Moodbot. Uh, among, uh, yeah, that's what I do, among other things. Uh, I'm going to talk about markets beyond Bitcoin. And I am especially interested in the long term way out there, really interesting things you can do with Bitcoin that you can't do right now at all. Uh, I want to build economics into protocols. And a good example uh, would be email. Let's say that uh, you, you uh, added a postage to every email that you sent. And we had a culture that said, um, oh, uh, I'm going to send bitcoins along with my email. If it's not spam, you're going to return the money or not take it. Uh, and if it is spam, you're going to take it. And that means we have an economic incentive not to send spam, because we, if we send spam, well, it's going to cost a lot of money. So that's good. Uh, in that case, it probably won't work, because email is a legacy protocol. You have tons of uh, anti-spam solutions. Uh, but we can do the same thing with new protocols. So we can build economics into protocols uh, using Bitcoin. Uh, and as I said in my abstract, we can disincentivize bad behaviors, we can create economic incentives where there have been none previously, we can create markets where we previously had inefficient barter, and so on. Um, I'm going to talk first about uh, what, what Bitcoin is, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, what uh, what some uh, under the hood features of Bitcoin are, and then I'm going to talk about transaction costs and new markets and opportunities. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin um, is the world's first decentralized electronic currency. It has no central authority. Issuance, that is the minting of money, is governed by, collectively by the network instead of by a central bank. And it's uh, existed for almost five years, and it's picking up steam. Today we have more Bitcoin wallets or clients where you store your Bitcoins than we had previously. Uh, we have desktop clients, we have mobile clients, we have web-based clients. Uh, up from, well, one, obviously, from the beginning. We have more merchant services where you can uh, easily accept Bitcoin as payments if you're a company or something like that. Uh, but it's not a necessity because, well, you can run your own infrastructure. You don't have to have a bank. You can just start your Bitcoin client and start accepting payments immediately. Uh, there's one of these, BitPay. They claim to have over 10,000 merchants. Uh, Coinbase has also over 10,000 merchants. Coinbase also has a web wallet uh, where they claim that they have 350,000 customer wallets. But it's hard to measure adoption because, well, Bitcoin is decentralized. Uh, this is uh, uh, blockchain.info. They have a service called My Wallet, which is also a web-based web wallet, and they have uh, see uh, around half a million wallets in that. We have tons of merchants, obviously, tens of thousands, uh, or uh, over ten thousand with BitPay, over ten thousand with Coinbase. Uh, the bigger names uh, that accept Bitcoin at this point are WordPress, Reddit, uh, 4chan, OJCupid, Namecheap, and a bunch of others. And there is a lot of uh, venture capital going into it right now. Uh, these are the markets. The biggest exchange market right now is BTC China. It's in China. I think that's cool. Uh, not Box was previously the biggest one. They had some issues with withdrawals. And uh, not all of these are um, serious, or I wouldn't call them serious. Uh, some of them are, some of the, the services that store your bitcoins or uh, are exchange markets, they are reckless amateurs. There seems to be, uh, let's see, three groups of people when it comes to exchange markets. There are the people that uh, are ignorant and don't know how difficult it can be to store digital gold, which is basically what Bitcoin is. They're gone. You can't 
uh, regain them when someone has stolen them. Um, uh, then there's the group that realize how hard this is, and they stay off. They don't do anything. And uh, okay, my point is there are people that create an exchange without having the proper security confidence. <coughs> Uh, market price right now, well, I think it's three hundred twenty-five dollars. Uh, here's January '09. There have been a few bubbles, but it's not like the giant famous bubble that should be obvious by now. Here's the same thing in uh, using a logarithmic scale, so you can see the relative uh, changes. Uh, this is the bubble in. Uh, 11, where it gone, went from like one dollar to thirty dollars, by far the biggest relative difference. Uh, this is the the most recent um, spike that was in the May, I think. And here's the market cap. Market cap is basically the exchange rate times how much Bitcoin there is. So that's also going up. Bitcoin is, I believe, uh, Bitcoin has a larger market cap than uh, the Senegal currency and the Icelandic and a bunch of other nations, which is kind of neat. Uh, so what are the advantages? Well, uh, Bitcoin has no concept of borders, so instant peer-to-peer -peer payments also means instant international payments. Bitcoin doesn't care if you're sending money to a Swedish SED or a poor farmer in Africa. It's irrelevant. As long as uh, the receiver has a Bitcoin wallet in their phone or on their computer or whatever, doesn't need to be connected to the net at the time, obviously, where, yeah, uh, they can receive money, which is great. Uh, it has great potential for consumer and merchant security. Your credit card is basically a number saying, oh, hey, here's my bank account. Take as much money as you want, which is why there is uh, things like chargebacks and lots of credit card fraud and stuff like that. Um, there is in, uh, immense potential in Bitcoin, but not, a, not all of it has been realized yet. Uh, so there's still a lot of, uh, you know, that. So it's also decentralized software to find money. Yeah, that is a huge thing. Uh, I Risks, wallet security, as I said, uh, there is a bunch of scalability issues uh, that can be solved, but they need to be addressed. The Bitcoin price is volatile. Uh, one of the scalability issues, by the way, is you can only send about seven transactions per second right now, um, which is enough, but, but not enough long term. Uh, there's also the question of uh, the security of the Bitcoin um, uh, the Bitcoin uh, system, the architecture, are the cryptographic primitives that Bitcoin use, are they combined in such a way that they don't break something? Like uh, recently there was a paper published, they claimed to have broken Bitcoin, that was not the case. The attack has actually been discussed before, or a variant of the attack. Um, but again, Bitcoin is still experimental, it's been existed for five years. Uh, but at this point, there doesn't seem to be any obvious flaws in it, because if there were any obvious architectural flaws, someone could steal millions of dollars, and they haven't. Uh, so how does it work? Well, this is a Bitcoin address. It's essentially, and now it's starting to get technical, but please bear with me. Uh, it's essentially the public part of a public-private key pair. Uh, it's something uh, called asymmetric encryption, where you have a private key that you keep yourself, and you have a public key that anyone else uh, can see. Uh, so they encrypt with a public key, and you um, you uh, decrypt with a private key. Or in this case, uh, you sign messages with a private key. So this is uh, the public key, essentially. When you send a payment using your Bitcoin wallet, what you're actually doing is creating and publishing a transaction that says uh, move ownership of uh, these Bitcoins uh, in this transaction over here uh, to this transaction over here. And the owner is, uh, yeah, whoever owns this public key, public key is the new owner. 
and then that new transaction is redeemable by unlocking it with uh, the, that public key's corresponding private key. The blockchain, that's a core concept in Bitcoin. It's a chain of blocks. Uh, the blocks contain the transactions. The most recent block contains the latest transactions. You can also say that the blockchain is a list of authorized transactions, beginning with the creation of the unit, the creation of the Bitcoin by a Bitcoin miner, and ending in the current transaction. Uh, this is a, another core concept in Bitcoin. The integrity and the chronological order of the blockchain are enforced with cryptography. And this is a key feature. It has existed before, it's previously known, but the combination of the, this distributed consensus system that decides that this is the state of the system. It's like having a database that is distributed among all computers, well, in, uh, globally in the Bitcoin network, and yet they can decide what truth is. And this solves the double spending problem. Uh, and the double spending problem is, if I have two transactions, I send the first one saying, oh, I want to move this money from here to here. And then I send the second transaction saying, I want to move the same money from here to here. Um, uh, which transaction should go first? And this is what this global consensus system decides. The first transaction you send that spends the money is the one that gets accepted. The second is refused. Uh, so, here's a transaction. Uh, you have a bunch of inputs. The input references the previous transaction. The outputs uh, state how much bitcoins are going to, um, well, is in every output. And then there's a list of conditions. And uh, so basically every transaction contains a predicate, the statement that evaluates the true or false. Um, and here's a more detailed view. And here we see input, the previous transaction is referenced. This is the hash of the previous transaction. Uh, script sig is the, what proves that, I, that I'm, I can spend these bitcoins. I'm saying this transaction, that index on that transaction, uh, uh, here's the proof that I can spend it. And this is the public key and the signature uh, that I chose. Uh, that okay. I have signed. I'm signing this message. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, that's sort of how it works. And here we have the output, and here is the the statement that is evaluated, and it has a bunch of operators. Um, how many people are programmers in here? And so, okay, so about half. Great. Um, this is really interesting. I'm not going to delve too deep into this because it's pretty complex. Um, uh, and it's more interesting talking about the, the high level features. If, uh, yeah, so let's, let's uh, this is basically all the, the operators that you can use. There are tons of them. Like you can use uh, addition, like plus minus, uh, you can say and or stuff, you can say, uh, Two out of three of these public keys uh, need to uh, sign uh, in order to to um, uh, to spend this transaction. What's the use of these conditions? I'm 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 uh, going to that. So um, here's here's a um, uh, regular transaction again with even more details. We see an interesting feature up here called lock time. Lock time says that you can't spend these monies. Um, this money um, until uh, specified uh, time. Um, so this is the most common transaction, as I said before. Um, and here it, here it is in another format. So basically, uh, the input is the, um, the pink part. Uh, it's a signature and the pub key, and uh, the rest is what's in the output in the previous transactions. Those are the conditions under which you can spend the transaction. So we evaluate this. And basically, row 3 to 6 says, check that uh, the pub key in the 
previous output is the same as the hash in the um, uh, yeah make sure that the the, the this the pub key that I've assigned is actually uh, the same pub key as is, as is in the, the output. Um, and then you check that this is a valid signature uh, for that pub key. This, that's what this one does. And then if the whole expression of value is true, that means you spend the money. I'm uh, not going to talk about this. Uh, smart contracts. So now we're getting into less technical things. What can you do with this? You can build statement, logical statements that say, yeah, these are the conditions. Okay, so you can do escrow and dispute mediation, for instance. Uh, escrow is where you have, uh, I want to transact with a counterparty, I don't trust the counterparty, so I'm sending the money to an escrow, uh, like when you, when you buy a house and you send the money to the real estate agent instead of immediately to the, uh, uh, your counterparty. So, but you don't want to send the money to the escrow because then the escrow may run away with it. So what you can do in, in uh, the Bitcoin payment system is you can say, okay, here are three pub keys. Two out of three of these uh, need to be used. Uh, so if me and the counterparty agrees, we, uh, we don't have to involve the escrow. If we don't agree, we involve the escrow. And if I and the escrow agrees, we sign a transaction that gives me back my money. If uh, the other party and the escrow agrees, the escrow and the other party uh, signs. So in that in that case, we can we can trust them. We trust the morality of the escrow agent, but we don't trust their computer security, for instance, because if they get hacked, they can't spend the money. Uh, assurance contracts. That's like Kickstarter. Uh, it essentially means only pay if enough money is raised. So. Uh, and you can use that to fund public goods, for instance. If everybody pays into this and um, uh, cooperates, uh, then this gets done. If not enough people pay, then uh, it doesn't get done. Micropayments is also really interesting. There are at least two parents today rapidly adjusted and probabilistic. But if you want to do really small transactions. You probably can't use uh, the regular method of doing micropayments because the transaction fee would, would be too high. What if you want really small units of value with, with uh, micro providers and the value offered by every seller is very low um, and you probably need to buy from lots of sellers because you have time, location, you need products, fit and all that. That would generate a lot of transactions, and we don't want that in the blockchain. So, we want to send bitcoins to a bank, essentially, so that they can use the bitcoins. Um, and uh, internally on that server, we want to do uh, payments with other customers of that bank. Or maybe that bank has relationships with other banks, just like in you know, regular life. Um, but uh, how do we do this programmatically? We can't, I mean, we can use an escrow and have another bank be the escrow, but then they can't, the first uh, bank or escrow can't really use the money, right? And what if they're actually the same entity? They're tricking us. And we can't rely on reputation because you can create an escrow, you can do good business for three years and become really big, and then you just say to everyone, ha ha, I'm running away with your money. That would suck. And we don't want human intervention here. We, um, we want, I want a program that under the hood uses economics and protocols. I don't want uh, a human to decide what parties to trust. That is bad design. We also don't want the center party. That is also bad design. So, that brings me to this contract. Um, <coughs> Uh, mutually short destruction. Uh, the inspiration comes from uh, deterrence theory, or you might know it as uh, nuclear war strategy. If you have um, two uh, parties, and I'm, we both have a button that destroys the other. 
that sucks. But it's also really useful. So what you do is you have your program here, uh, and you have your off-chain bank here that you can't trust. You both send the same amount of bitcoins into a multi-signature transaction that specifies that in order to spend this uh, forward to another transaction, both parties have to agree and sign this. That is what you do. You don't publish this in the network um, yet. Uh, then you create another transaction that goes from this transaction to this transaction that says boom. And this makes all the money unspendable. Uh, over here, you make another transaction that says lock time one week. You can't spend, you, you can't spend this money in uh, one week. But when one week has passed, you can publish this transaction, and both parties will uh, get back uh, their bitcoins. So, what does this mean? Uh, this means that there are no economic incentives to steal, because, okay, so this is how we start our relationship with the bank. We then make a different bitcoin transaction, where I can send uh, n bitcoins, I can send more, but as long as I send less than n bitcoins to the bank, uh, they can run away with my money. But my software will destroy n money. So they will at most go uh, you know, plus minus zero. And uh, hopefully they will be at a loss. Uh, and the reason we make this transaction is that if either party um, has a hardware uh, failure or uh, just disappears, we want the money to, to go back to their original owners. So we publish this in the blockchain, and we keep these, both parties keep these. And if the bank does something bad, we say boom. If we don't want to transact anymore, we publish this transaction. Um, so the money is locked in for a week, and then you know, as that uh, uh, time is, you know, almost here, we, we can either extend the relationship or publish that transaction. And, and uh, there are multiple uh, very useful things you can do with this. Uh, one thing I haven't thought about that I thought was interesting, you can actually use this to sell things uh, to strangers over the internet without eBay or Targera. Because if you make Let's say you make n, uh, uh, like 200, 300 times the value of whatever you're transacting. Uh, you don't have to have an, an intermediary because you can. I mean, I get the computer, but but if I don't pay him, uh, I'll lose three times the value. That would suck. So let's take a detour into something called transaction costs. And transaction costs are basically the costs of participating in a market. And let's see what we have here. Okay, bargaining and contracting. Check. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, as humans, I mean. Um, that is done by the software. Policing and enforcement. That is also done uh, in a piece of software that uses mutual assured disruption. Uh, uh, that leads to search and information costs. So these are all costs. You get that if you, if, you, if you want to transact, if you want to use the price mechanism, if you want to use the market, you have to search for the product, you have to inform yourself regarding the product, you have to uh, talk about the terms, and you have to sign a contract. You then, if something goes uh, bad, you have to enforce that contract and punish the counterparty somehow. Uh, but as you can see, these two can be solved by using something like mutual assured destruction. So that leaves certain information costs. And that depends on, on, um, on what you want to use it for. There are uh, ways for programs to determine that this product is actually the product I'm looking for. For instance, in uh, BitTorrent, uh, you can't, the, the, the software can't decide that, yes, this is the content I'm looking for. But the software can see that, okay, this piece of data that I just got is the data that I was ordered to download. 
um, so, so that depends on, on the use case. Um, you can make a BitTorrent market, for instance. So uh, the uh, BitTorrent today uses a tit for tat algorithm, which is basically barter. You connect to a swarm and you say, hey, I have data. And uh, uh, you can transact data with other nodes in the swarm. Um, and, and then it uses something called optimistic unchoking, which means that if you don't have any data, uh, the other peers will actually give you a little bit. And then, because everyone will download uh, a random piece of data in the, in the like if you want to download a, a big file, I may download this part and you download this part, and um, collectively uh, we can spread this uh, file in a much faster time than if we had a, a central party. So, but the, 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 issue, the issue here is that Bitcoin uses tit for tat bar, and it's slow sometimes. So, uh, if you replace this with a market using uh, mutually short destruction with off-chain banks, you have a BitTorrent client that works just like your BitTorrent client works today, but under the hood you're actually making and getting Bitcoin payments. Uh, if you upload as much as you download, you won't pay. Um, a market, that would mean more choices. You can have for-profit seeders that are specialized in um, distributing data. Uh, no upload is acceptable because you pay if you don't upload. So if you don't have any upload capacity or for some reason you don't want to, you just push money in one direction and you get data in the other direction. And that's how it should be. Uh, risk with this, of course, um, probably more illegal if you're using this for copyright infringement. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, but that seems like the one thing that you might have to think about. Again, it would be very cool and it would make the global Bitcoin uh, uh, you know, world uh, work like private trackers uh, where people have an incentive to share as much as they download. You can make anonymous internet on tap. And this is probably long-term bad for uh, the company that I co-founded. Uh, I don't know if I said it before, but I, uh, I run uh, MoveBot, which is a VPN service. Uh, I would love for this to happen. This would be great. Uh, the, the personal VPN market is a huge market inefficiency. There are uh, a bunch of services out there with varying quality. It would be great to have um, uh, more professional work done on a smaller number of clients and solutions. Uh, Tor is a brilliant example. Uh, the, the people that built to, uh, Tor and, and the, the anonymous browsing solutions surrounding that, like the Tor browser bundle, they know what they're doing. Um, well, I know what I'm doing too, but uh, yeah, there are others who don't. So with this, you can you can have you can have multiple behaviors too. You can have some people who hop around and they would use any exit node um, they wish for. Others would choose trusted exit nodes depending on their current need. Like you might want an IP address in uh, US or in Sweden or whatever. And uh, these will of course be provided by uh, trusted providers such as tour servers, Mulvod, Amnesty International. So there will still be an economy, there will still be a place for VPN services, but people will be able to move much more freely. Uh, it will uh, push down the profit margins. It will uh, give better security for uh, the people who are currently using personal VPN, because this would be a better solution. It would be more anonymous. And more Tor users in the Tor network means more protection uh, for um, people that use it. And you might say that, well, uh, this means that it won't be free. Well, if we have uh, uh, times 1,000 Tor users, there will surely be a lot of 
uh, companies uh, or organizations that still donate capacity for free. Uh, yeah, if you're more interested in this, um, this is not an exist yet, uh, but there is uh, the best uh, in, um, incentive research uh, project within Tor or related to Tor is the Lira white paper that you can Google. Uh, they also talked about the previous attempts to do something like this. It's still it's still not very good, but but uh, and it doesn't use Bitcoin uh, or anything with the same um, potential, but but it's still um, a step in the right direction. Uh, excuse me, can you please say something from what the aggregation stands for? Because it's quite hard to search for. Lira. Yeah, Lira. Oh, I'll, I'll we'll talk about it afterwards. Sweet. So, what, can, what more can you do? Well, you can. Uh, uh, you can do wireless nexus points. You can do mobile phone, you know, network operators. Why isn't my phone talking with the neighborhood and saying, "Hey, I need to download data. I need lots of bandwidth." And then it negotiates with all the operators uh, nearby and says, "Okay, you have the best price. Great, I'll go with you." And then it can see, "Okay, this is this is too slow. I'm actually going to jump to someone else." Um, or I need low latency because I'm making a call, and then it will make a call. And so this isn't done today for various reasons, um, but uh, Bitcoin makes this possible. We can create protocols that uh, have economics in them. You will have automatic billing and the whole that whole mess. You know, dealing with payments that are sub uh, cent payments. That doesn't make sense if you have people doing the work. But if you have everything automatic, and I just, I charge my phone with bitcoins, and I get cell phone service. Of course that how, that's how, she, how it should work. It would also give an economic incentive for people that have access points at home to actually share them. I mean, you should share them anyway. But, um, but having an economic incentive uh, means uh, more people will do it. And if you include these, hopefully, open source, well, as the open source, protocols in your home router, uh, yeah, win, basically. Um, notice also that I haven't, I haven't actually talked about anything else than business to consumer um, solutions uh, or stuff that you can do with this because uh, well, if you, I think, I think, if you have, if you want to, if you, uh, if you want to see, uh, I mean, this, these use cases are obvious to you, uh, but if you want to discover business to business uh, things, that requires domain specific knowledge for, for that industry. So you need to be in that industry to actually see that, aha, this is what I'm going to use economics and protocols for. Um, but it's much easier for us as consumers, because we are consumers, to, to relate and say, oh, it would be nice with, you know, anonymous internet on tap, for instance. And I haven't talked about a lot of stuff. Um, there is another very good talk by a guy called Mike Kern that talks about banking with no banks, uh, where you can use uh, smart property, you can have smart property in the uh, blockchain, you can create stock markets, you can create funds. Um, the fact that we have a distributed consensus system in the blockchain, or that is what it is, or in, it's also, as you saw before, it's a decentralized timestamp server. That is great. Timestamping. Why isn't anyone using this? I mean, I could, um, okay, just, just as an example. Someone says, oh, uh, um, well, you have a piece of information, you put a hash of it in the blockchain. Um, you shouldn't do this, but, but um, there are ways to. Uh, anyway, uh, you, put a, you put information in the blockchain, and that is, uh, uh, well, it's time spent. So you can, you can go back and prove that I, I actually knew this information at this time because it's in the blockchain. And you could use this for patents, or you could use it for, uh, well, I'm sure there are a number of uh, uses. If nothing else, I can, 
I can I could use it to prove that uh, I say, oh, I, I knew this for a long time, and then someone else says, ah, oh, you didn't, and I say, I, I actually did because look here, it's in the blockchain. That would be fun, <laughs> and people do that. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, for uh, creating Bitcoin. Uh, Donald Gamshon, my colleague, for uh, discussing uh, Bitcoin at length with me for hundreds of hours. Mike Hearn for doing work on contracts. Uh, Bitcoin.org, because that is from where I got a lot of the, the formulations. I try to, I search the web for the best way to, to describe some of the things that I describe. And countless others for doing the same thing. Um, if you want to talk to me, you can send an email to fspons2013 at insta.org. Um, I hope you have enjoyed my talk, and I now leave the floor open for questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how about the VAT and income tax if everybody uses Bitcoin? Um, uh, VAT and income tax, if everyone uses Bitcoin, will probably be difficult to enforce. There are other forms of taxes that you can enforce. You can enforce property tax. Um, you can, uh, if you have, um, uh, well, if you ask me, uh, maybe we don't need taxes, but uh, that's a whole different thing. You can make, uh, I mean, you, you could use insurance contracts, for instance, to, to uh, to create public goods, uh, uh, you can use something called dominant assurance contracts, which means uh, if I send money to this contract and the contract is um, complete, then the public good will be produced, and that's good for everyone. And then a dominant assurance contract, that, that's like a hint to game theory, and it means that if I send money to this assurance contract and the contract isn't completed, I get my money back plus I get uh, a small portion on top of that. So either way I win. If, the public, if I send money in and the public good is produced, I win. If the, the public good isn't produced, I get my money back plus uh, uh, interest. Uh, so that, that, but that's that's not related to why we need or don't need taxes. But but uh, yes, uh, the short version is uh, some taxes will be unenforceable. Yes. But uh, if you sell stuff with uh, bitcoins, then you make a profit, and then you can declare the profit and and get taxed uh, a VAT from from your sales. Sure, but but. Uh, but you have a similar really problem today in other situations, like if you sell something on Craigslist or block it, it's called in Sweden. Yeah, um, but if but you do it in, if you do it in a small scale, it's it's very hard to enforce the VAT or the taxes on it. But as soon as you start to do something in a bigger scale, then it's more difficult. To yeah, absolutely. The so it, it won't be revenue service, and it's the same thing with uh, if you make big sales with an alternative current like like Bitcoin, eventually you will end up in a situation where you want to use the money somewhere else and, and, and then it's more difficult to avoid uh, taxing or Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good description. So it won't be completely unenforceable. Of course, if you're a big actor, uh, it'll be hard to hide the money, but if by using Bitcoin, it will be um, uh, easier to do um, to, to hide money than it is today. Uh, who was first? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, some years ago, I did some work on the big cash and people like this big cash company, mm -hmm. which, ultimately, which ultimately paid. Yeah. They struck me the other day that you could do something like that with Bitcoin as the back end, so you can do this without even having a bank account. To yeah. Your... Absolutely. Uh, so, so that is that that's definitely useful. Uh, if if you're interested in this. Uh, uh, could you repeat the point here? Okay, sure. Uh, so he, he talked about uh, Biggie Cash and the fact that you can use you can you can have a bank uh, or something similar where you 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 back you back the balances in the bank with Bitcoin, which is basically what I talked about when I said an off-chain bank. You send bitcoins to the bank and then you can transact internally on the bank. And uh, of course, 
on that bank you can do cool things that you couldn't can't do in the blockchain. Uh, for instance, you can do uh, anonymous digital cash using something called uh, uh, Showman Cash. Uh, or uh, it's yeah, yeah, look it up. Um, yes, you also cannot enforce. Uh, income tax or VAT if you would have a system for representing money as physical tokens such as coins or mm. paper yeah. which you already have so apparently it works despite that uh, I mean uh, you, you, I can give you a paper money mm -hmm. and there would be no trace it's already anonymous so you already cannot enforce VAT if you use paper money oh I see um, I think you can validate in my phone now. yeah, yeah. Yeah, as I said, it's not. Uh, he's he's correct. It's not a completely unenforceable, but it will be. Uh, it will be harder to enforce. Can we can we agree on that? Yes. Okay. But this uh, next question. Um, just to clarify, I, I didn't understand. Well, actually, I got like two questions. One was you said uh, seven transactions per second, and that I don't quite understand because that seems so low based on my understanding of how much is going on right now. And then the other question is like. Just not on whatever level you want to say, what's like the greatest risk, um, you know, whether it's to the individual or to the network as a whole, whatever, to the whole Bitcoin thing. Okay. Uh, the first question, uh, seven transactions per second is because uh, every transaction is around, I think, 270 bytes or something like that. And every, there's a, there's a, uh, every block uh, contains like the blocks contain transactions, and every block can only be uh, one megabyte. Uh, so, and, and since every block is, uh, block is produced every 10 minutes, that would be, uh, well, do the math. It comes out to, to uh, seven transactions per second, roughly. And that is, that is not like the uh, forever, uh, but it will require some substantial changes. Um, uh, but but it's 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 not a it's not a uh, it's not a big issue. But but uh, it's yeah it's something that needs to be fixed. As far as risks, um, I don't know. I I think at this point I'm I'm thoroughly convinced that Bitcoin is the greatest thing since the internet. There are certainly bad things about it, um, and there are certainly risks. One of them being. Well, uh, if, if governments start to don't like it, then they're going to start punishing exchanges. I mean, the, the, the points at which you try to get fiat money out of the system, um, or, or maybe they, they may be illegal uh, altogether. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's decentralized. If you have a central party such as eGold, that was a digital currency backed in gold, you can just go and take the gold. Whereas with uh, BitTorrent, uh, there is no one to to um, to punish or with be, Bit all the time. Bitcoin. Uh, there is no central party. More questions? Yes. Um, I was thinking about the traceability of transactions. Sure. Um, so since Bitcoin is decentralized uh, and all transactions are public and are in the blockchain, um, uh, well, you can, you can trace all transactions that have ever occurred. You cannot trace transactions that have occurred off the chain, of course. Um, but, but you can see everything in the blockchain. Uh, those transactions are not necessarily tied to a real-life identity, because, well, they're just random numbers, essentially. Uh, but let's say that you tell someone that, aha, I own the money right here, and then you uh, make a transaction that sends money to, let's say, WikiLeaks, uh, huh? Just as Facebook, you can make graphs. Sure, you can you can make graphs of the transactions, and you can you can notice patterns. Uh, and and one of the solutions to this would be to use uh, off-chain transactions, um, where you have you have banks uh, that you transact on internally, or uh, you can uh, uh, mix bitcoins with other bitcoins uh, in. Okay, I think uh, that's time's up. Um, thank you.